Well, hello. It's good to be with you, and it's good to be here in the desert. We've got a, a Bedouin tent, a goat hair tent, and we're going to think in this session about the desert dwellers, and we're going to go back to the time of Abraham. Uh, we have Abraham's servant here, and uh, that looks like somebody from the family. And I can't see Abraham at the moment, but perhaps he'll be along in a moment or two. We're going to read, first of all, uh, from Genesis, from Genesis chapter 12 and from verse 1. And this is about the call of Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all his possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. And then in, in the letter to the Hebrews, there's just a little explanation about uh, Abraham and uh, what uh, the situation there when he was called by God meant. In the faith chapter of Hebrews, in chapter 11, and in verse 8, we read these words. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder was God. And so we see in those words from Scripture that Abraham was 75 years old when he was called by God to go to the promised land. And then we read how, how God made a covenant with him. Did God keep his word? Well, of course he did. And we can see that round about us today. And the third thing was that he lived in a tent. And so, as we think about Abraham and the desert dwellers today, we're going to look at the situation that Abraham found himself in. We're going to look at his camel. We're going to look at his servants and those in his family. And we're going to look at the goat hair tent. Hello. We're back in the desert near to the goat hair tent. And um, we're going to look at Abraham. And we have a costume that Abraham would have worn and been familiar with. Um, this is modelled on a, a costume that uh, is in the possession of CMJ, Church's Ministry Among Jewish People. And uh, they have uh, a genuine costume, several hundred years old, and uh, I've managed to, to copy it. Um, now, we, as we, we look at it, we see, first of all, there is what's known as a kafir. And um, this is a sort of kafir worn by Abraham, who was, among his people, a sheikh or chieftain. And it had several uses. First of all, it would protect the, the head from sun, uh, so he didn't get sunstroke. And then also, uh, you could pull the kafir up and right across the nose, just allowing a slit for the eyes, and um, when there was a, a, a sandstorm. So it was very useful and uh, ideal for desert conditions. And the next thing was this, this band, this coil, which kept uh, the kafir on. And this was doubled over and, and wound around the head, and uh, this is called an agal. Now, the agal was used uh, at night when the... Um, 
her camels were outside the tent. Now, I'm not a, a betting man, but uh, if you know anything about uh, horse racing, you may have heard the expression about a, a horse being nobbled. Well, back in, in Abraham's day and all through the generations with the, the uh, uh, desert people, um, at night they would take off their agal, they would uh, put it on the, turn it into a figure of eight, uh, put it up the, the camel's legs and over his knobbly knees, and uh, the, the, that would prevent the, the camel uh, running away. And so that's where the expression uh, nobbled comes from. The next thing was the, the tunic inside here, and that, this, one, this particular one is green in colour. Uh, sometimes they were white, uh, just like the uh, friend at the back there, and um, uh, they had long sleeves for the, for the chieftain and his son. We read, of course, of, uh, about Joseph, who was uh, the son, uh, the favourite son of Jacob. And we read in some, in the AV, in some translations, it says uh, he, he had a coat of many colours. And in, in, in more modern translations, it says a coat uh, ornamented with long sleeves. And we think it would have been these long sleeves, which you can still see in the desert today among the, the Bedouin people, and that was a sign of leadership. And uh, a tunic like this would have been worn by uh, a chief and his son. Uh, obviously, if you've got these long sleeves, you can't do a lot of work. And in order to get uh, into the, the uh, abba, the, the coat, or the, the abaya, the cloak, um, you have to wind the sleeves around your, your arm like that and then put your, your arm through the, the armholes. And that, as I say, was a sign of leadership. Whoever wore this costume was in charge. The next thing is the girdle. This is made in, in wool and uh, just, a, a, just a band of, of cloth tied round. Um, in some versions of the Bible it's called a girdle, but uh, more often nowadays it's um, uh, called a belt, for obvious reasons. Uh, the next thing is the abba, the coat. You can see on the servant here he's wearing an, an abba, a coat with, with sleeves. He's wearing a, a camel hair coat. Uh, or this, this coat here, which is uh, called a cloak, it's an abaya, and um, it, it just, it's just a square of cloth, really, uh, cut down the middle uh, to make, make the, the sort of overcoat, and um, you put your, your arms through the, the armholes. Now, everything about this, this costume uh, denotes uh, wealth. Every part of it has gold threads in it, the tunic, the, uh, the cloak, um, the um, uh, a bear, and the a gull. And so it would be instantly recognisable as someone who was a rich man and a sheikh or chieftain. Now, one thing that the, the chief had was some sort of pole or staff or stave. Sometimes this would have been a spear. And we've got a spear here. I'm just going to um, pick that up like that. There we are. And this would have sometimes fancy sort of uh, 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 tassels on, the, on the, the top, just under the, uh, the spear part there, the metal part. And the, the chieftain, as he was travelling around, uh, you know, looking for an encampment, um, he would, when he came to the right place, stick his spear into the ground and his tent would be pitched next to the spear. And that tent would be in the centre of the camp. So he could have a, a spear like that. So this is the staff or the stave that a chieftain or sheikh would hold in his hand. 
as a sign of authority. Now, sometimes in the scriptures, um, because Hebrew only has consonants and not vowels, uh, you can get different meanings for the same word. And the word for stave or staff is matter. And translated into English, that's M-A-T-T-E-H. But there's a, another word for bed or bedhead, which is M-I-T-T-A-H. So there's matter or matter. And mate, for the staff, um, has the vowels A and E, and the mata, mita, for the, for, the, um, uh, for the bed, has I and A. Now, um, in early translations into English of the Old Testament scriptures, in Genesis 47 and verse 31, it speaks about uh, Jacob prophesying and it speaks about his bed. But uh, in Hebrews, it mentions about the staff. And it seems to be a discrepancy. In later translations, it just speaks about the staff in both passages. And so, um, these, uh, uh, the staff is the correct translation. It's only because of the way uh, you can read Hebrew. Of course, uh, nowadays they have the um, vowel points to make it absolutely clear. Now, um, uh, the, the staff was the pledge that Tamar asked of Judah, uh, spoken of in Genesis 38. And Moses' staff was his matter, uh, found in Exodus chapter 4 and verses 2 and 20. And so we see what an important thing this was. Of course, you don't see many of these uh, uh, staves like this nowadays. Well, you can't get the staff, can you? We read of three types of people in the scriptures. The first were the desert dwellers, and in Arabic, that's Bedouin or Bedouin. And of course, the Bedouin is still about today. And then there are the village people, and they're known as the Fellahin, and then the townsfolk, who are the Beladine. And so the desert dwellers are really on the lowest rung of the ladder. They really exist among sun, sand, palm trees, and camels. And they live in goat hair tents. Now, life among the Bedouin has remained almost the same, unchanged, really, for the most part, since the days of Genesis. Hot days and cold nights, sun and sand. There are uh, landmarks, visible, not visible to us, but visible to them. And uh, they're still able to navigate with their camels across vast uh, spaces of desert. The camels are quite rightly referred to as ships of the desert. And they can subsist on the poorest of food. And they can store water and drink some 27 gallons at one go. Just think of the water that Rebecca uh, had to uh, get from the well uh, for Abraham's ten camels that were brought to her family by uh, his servant. They're used for transport. Camel dung is used for fuel. Camel hair is woven and made into clothing. And camel meat may be eaten, although it's very tough. Well, I thought I would just uh, give you a recipe. Uh, my wife Sally will be speaking about the women of the desert a bit later on. But I'm going to uh, just give you a recipe that's come to me uh, because it's, 
you know, it can be nice to have camel meat now and again, but as I say, it's very tough. Now, this is a, a recipe. First of all, put the camel meat into a pot. Uh, place next to the, uh, the meat a large stone or rock. Cover with water, place on the fire, and bring to the boil. Keep an eye on the, the pot with the simmering water, and now and again just top it up. And then when the, the stone is soft, the camel meat will be nice and tender. We're going to look now at the goat hair tent and, as it is today, used by the Bedouin uh, tribesmen. We can visit a, a Bedouin encampment and um, I have visited one and, uh, you know, they always give a good welcome to people. It's the, the desert hospitality. Now, we read in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 21 that Noah lived in a tent. That's the first reference. In verse 27 of that same chapter, uh, the tents of Shem are mentioned. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were all tent dwellers. And the people of Israel under Moses lived in tents during their 40 years in the wilderness. The Bedouin claimed descent from Ishmael. And the Bible says of him, he will be a donkey, a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. We find that in Genesis 16 and verse 12. And many people say, well, that's just as they are. They like to be independent and free spirits. The Bedouin are nomads, wandering by choice, uh, not going to towns very often except to buy supplies. They're happiest in open sp spaces, in the vast expanse of the desert. As both pasture and water are scarce, they are constantly moving on. They still live in tents made of black goat hair. Now, we think of goat hair in this country mainly of being white because our goats are mainly white. But in the Middle East, and particularly in Israel, the goats are brown or black. And just to cinch it in the Song of Songs and uh, chapter 1 and verse 5, we read, dark like the tents of Kedar. They have the women's quarters, which are separate from the main guest part of the tent. And it was in this guest part where the men meet together and talk. The men don't really do a lot of work. They, they look after the encampment. They look after the flocks, the, the sheep and the goats. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, they take a very relaxed attitude to life. It's the ladies who do all the work. And we'll be learning about that a little later on. Now, we said earlier on that the traditions of the uh, Bedouin have remained the same for thousands of years. But nowadays they are just accepting some new ideas. For instance, one year, about, I think it was 1992, I think, um, we went to a Bedouin encampment and, uh, you know, they, apart from maybe a, a couple of trucks, they lived in the same way as they'd always lived. But then in 2001, um, as I was travelling along the road from uh, Bethlehem to the Dead Sea, we passed a, a, a Bedouin encampment on our left-hand side. And there the tents were as they'd been before, but there was one difference. Outside and fixed onto the top of the tents were satellite dishes. 
And so the, the men now, as well as maybe gambling and smoking and drinking coffee, they're now able to watch television. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And it continues, In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilions. The black goat hair is woven in strips and they have a, a, you know, the, the loom, a peg looms in the, in the desert and the ladies uh, do the weaving and they weave together uh, goat hair and make it into strips of the width of the loom. And then the strips are put together, fixed with metal clasps or wooden splinters or needles uh, to make up the wider pieces of goat hair. The goat hair is a marvellous material. When it gets wet, the strands of goat hair expand and make it completely waterproof. When it dries out in the summer season, so it contracts and tiny pinpricks appear. And so it makes it just really like air conditioning. Now, when the uh, little boy uh, grows up in a, uh, a goat hair tent, um, and maybe he goes out for the first time at night with his father, uh, a father will say to him that the, uh, the goat hair is just like the sky. And as he looks through the, the goat hair tent, so he will see these tiny pinpricks of light which appear like stars in the sky. And so his father will say to the boy, well, God has, has pitched his tent in the heavens. And it's just like we're covered with a goat hair tent. So, of course, this, you know, the boy is, is not frightened anymore and he regards the outside at night just as if he were in God's tent. The goat hair tent is kept up with poles and uh, this tent behind me is what is known as a one-pole tent, the smallest tent you can get. This will be regarded as a, a starter home, if you like, and, uh, of course, the, the tent can be added to as the family increases. We read in the scriptures in Psalm 27 and verse 5 that safety is found under the Lord's tent. And then we read that the tents of the upright will flourish according to Proverbs 14 and verse 11. The tents of the wicked are to be avoided, it says in Psalm 84 and verse 10. And a collapsing tent is a symbol of death and destruction, according to Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 20. Now, I once heard of a, a Bedouin who was asked, how do, you, how do you know if there is a God? And the man replied, how do I know if a man or a camel has passed by my tent last night by the footprints in the sand. And of course, as we look around us, we can see God's handiwork. We can see that God has created the heavens and the earth. And as it says in Psalm 19, that psalm that we begun with, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion.